Roberts. Welcome to Old Path Ministries. Today we start the book of Judges as we have just completed the book of Joshua. And now we move on to the next in the books and it does follow a chronology as you'll be able to see in the opening verses. But chapter one kind of um, backtracks a little bit because it gives some history of things that have already taken place place, but it's trying to be put in the context of here are the things that happen next. And it, it goes through a, a bit of a summary of some of the things that the tribes did um, in occupying the land while Joshua was still alive. And it really kind of sets up for what you see in chapter uh, in chapter two and then leading to the judges that we see in chapter three. Um, I think it's pretty important to, to point out that what we have here in the book of Judges really kind of helps uh, for us to understand, once again, a major transition in the history of Israel and uh, now coming back into the land since they occupy it. Think about this. From the time that God raised up Moses, uh, Moses was that person that, that God did everything through, and he was the person that God used to lead the people. We know that when Moses died, that next person was Joshua, and there really wasn't a whole lot of contesting that fact for either one of them. There were people who challenged Moses along the way, but we all know what happened with them. So here we had two successive uh, men that led the children of Israel from the time of the Exodus. By the time that we get to the book of Judges, it is clear that they don't have any kind of a leader. And uh, in that kind of absence, Rather than really looking for the Lord to lead them in every particular way, you're going to see what ends up happening. There's just a, a real disconnect in the people, and you pretty much see that it really had its, its beginnings, even in the time that they came into the land, because they never really, even under Joshua, they never fully realized what God wanted them to do. So before we look at the text, let's remember this, because it's going to be very important as we look through even the first couple of chapters here. What God had said, when I bring you into this land, I want you to eliminate all of the nations that are there. Don't leave them among you because there'll be a corrupting influence. So that was about as clear and as straightforward as God could have made it. His concern was that if they remain, then you'll start to buy into their idolatry. And we see that there was compromise almost from the very beginning, but that compromise became widespread, as we'll see. And there were these groups that were allowed to stay and remain in the land and then start to commingle. And it didn't take hardly any time, seemingly, for the corruption of their idolatry and all of their spiritual wickedness to make its way into the, into the children of Israel. The very thing that God cautioned them about was the thing that they did not take heed to. And in a twofold way, they left the people alive. And as a result, they started to buy into all of their sin and their idolatry. And that's where we find ourselves in the in the text as we get to the book of Judges. So chapter 1 is going to be kind of a bit of a review of the things that had taken place um, that were kind of contemporary with uh, some of it is clearly during Joshua's time. But what we see here is in the opening verses, uh, when it comes to Joshua, or when it comes to the, the children of Israel after Joshua's death, they do inquire of the Lord, who's next? What do we do? And notice that it's not one person. It's not Moses. It's not Joshua coming to the Lord and saying, what's next? It's the entire assembly, which means there really is no leadership. And God just designates Judah, uh, the tribe of Judah. Um, and then you see that it just didn't do well from that moment on. So, um, interesting question. Who is the person that Joshua could have assigned to this? Um, we don't have anything in here in the text that would tell us whether or not that was a discussion that, that uh, Joshua was looking for, that he had, did he not have a hand-picked person like Moses did with Joshua? There are so many questions that you could ask, but you will really never get a full answer to. We just see when man has the ability to continue doing the things that God has first put in place, the more that they rebel against God's instruction, the further they will get away from what his ultimate will would be. He clearly, God did, bringing them out of, the, uh, out of uh, Egypt during the, uh, during the Exodus, God clearly wanted it to be headed up by a person that God could go directly to and give direction to the entire nation. 
There's no reason for us to believe that he didn't want this to continue after Joshua. But by the time that Joshua died, there was already compromise pretty much throughout all of the children of Israel in all of the territories where they had settled. And you'll kind of see that because they're held responsible by the time that we get to chapter 2. So with that being said, let's turn to chapter 1 and let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we come before your word today, we're asking that you would give us understanding as we read and understanding as we study that your spirit would be our guide and our teacher. And that as we study this bit of history, that we would also get a chance to understand how you interact with your people, how you've done things in the past that we might be able to glean truth in our days and not repeat the same you know, series of, of misery that, that we see what happens from disobedience. So Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in our study and that you would speak to us through your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. All right, so chapter 1, verse 1 says, Now after the death of Joshua. So it's weird how this, this chapter does jump around because it wants us to realize, leaving the end of what we saw in the book of Joshua, after the death of Joshua, then what was to be done with, this is a way that, that this kind of lays out, what was to happen next? How are we going to get leadership? And God is going to say Judah. And then what we're going to get in chapter 1 is Judah and a few of the other tribes, what they did even during Joshua's time. It's just kind of a, of a rewind. Some of these stories we're familiar with. Uh, others we don't know a whole lot about. Uh, many of the places named here, we can't tell you for sure where they are. They're kind of lost to history. And this is a history that's thousands of years old anyway, so it wouldn't be easy to begin with. But with all of that said, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked of the Lord. So you see the, almost immediately this very different transition. No longer is it, is it Joshua going before the Lord. It's the entire, it's the congregation of the children of Israel looking for direction. So they said, who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So no longer are they looking for one person to give direction. Now they're saying, who's going to go? And God chooses an entire tribe, Judah. And so we see uh, the Lord said, Judah will go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. Important to remember. Over and over and over again, God has said, I have delivered. If they would be obedient to do what God asks them to do without wavering and being to the letter, if they were being obedient to everything that God said, there would be no problem. Yet they're already experiencing so much of that because they have not been um, willing to go to the extent that God has asked them to do. So corruption has already made its way in. So then verse 3 says, So Judas said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me uh, to the allotted territory that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. That was not what God had instructed them to do. Follow Judah. Judah will go do this. It should be all of them working as a person, but Ju uh, Judah would be able to lead the way. Didn't need to make coalitions. He was to lead. Well, we know that if even in Simeon, when you look at the allotment of the tribal lands, Simeon really had a possession way in the southern part of what Judah had. Just kind of a circular area that they believe that was pretty much occupied by Simeon. So unlike the other ones where there would be a border between one tribe to the next, Simeon settled within the territory allotment that was all surrounding them of Judah. Kind of interesting as you look at it like that. But verse 4 says, So Judah went up, and uh, the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they killed 10,000 men of, Bede, uh, of Bezek. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek and fought against him. This is the king. Adonai Bezek is the king. And uh, they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And Adonai uh, Bezek uh, fled. They pursued him, they caught him, and they cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Now, we might wonder, what's that all about? Well, you're going to find out by his own, uh, his, his cruelty apparently was pretty well known. And so basically what they have done to him is what he would do to others. And you see that in his own words. Because in verse 7 it said, And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes uh, cut off, used to gather scraps under my tables, as I have done, so God has repaid me. 
and then they uh, brought him to Jerusalem and he died. So from maybe from the wounds of that, but he basically says, what you guys just did to me is what I've done to other kings. So now the Lord has repaid me for my cruelty. Verse 8 says, now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem. They took it. They struck it with the edge of the sword and they set the city on fire. That's something Benjamin wasn't able to do. So it shows that we have some history that's taken place. These are some of the exploits of Judah that are happening currently, but then they're going to look back, as you're going to see in a few moments, with what Caleb said. We find it, it's it's almost a carbon, well, it is a carbon copy of what uh, the taking of, of the territory where Caleb went to, um, of one particular city, and how he gave his daughter as a, as a gift to the person who could do it. We'll see that in just a moment. It tells us in verse uh, 9, so after the burning of Jerusalem, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountains, in the south, and in the lowlands. Then Judah went against the Canaanites who dwelt there in Hebron. Uh, now the name of Hebron was formerly Kirjath Arba, and they killed uh, um, Sheshurai, uh, Ahiman, and Talmai. Now, Hebron, in case you're wondering, this is one of those cities that we do know. In fact, you can go visit Hebron now, ancient city. But if you're thinking about like where the, the Dead Sea would be on the east, if you were to look at pretty much right in the middle of it, and you go just a little under 20 miles to the west, that's where Hebron is. So it's considered, you know, kind of in the lower parts of the, the West Bank area, not quite that far. I don't think that the West Bank goes quite down there. It's just inside of it, I should say. Hebron is an area that's difficult to get to now, but it's it's a very uh, in, interesting and very important place as uh, as Israel would, would look at it. Caleb was, uh, was there in that place, as you'll see. Caleb, the same one that was a spy with Joshua. So it says, um, and then from there, they went against the inhabitants of Debir, and the name of Debir was formerly Kirjath Sefer. And then Caleb said, what what took when they took that was all the way back again. This is recorded for us in in Joshua 15. Because if you remember, this is where they had kind of gone in, and and Caleb said, you know, I want to go back to to uh, this area around Hebron and that area. I want to go there because that's where all the giants are. He wanted to go there. Joshua gave him leave, said that you can go there. And this is a repeat of because you know he's Judah and uh, or he's in that area of Judah rather. And these are the areas where Judah ended up inhabiting. And so that's what's being mentioned here. So Caleb said, um, whoever attacks Kirjah Sefer and takes it to him, I will give my daughter Aksa as wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, uh, he took it. And so he gave his daughter Achish as wife. So there's a question, was it his nephew or was it actually his younger brother? And, uh, you know, depending on who you ask and, and how they look at the original language, there are people that would say it's either or. But no matter how it is, there was one person that said, I'll go take it for you as a, as a person of war. And so he did. And so he gives his daughter as wife. So um, verse 14, so it happened when she came to him that she urged him uh, to ask her father for a field. And so she dismounted from her donkey. Caleb said to her, what do you wish? If you look at what's said in, in, um, in Joshua, um, it was her, her husband that uh, initially was the one who went to Caleb and said, we want land. And uh, so the allotment of the land was not necessarily to her pleasing. And so she went back to her father and said, you know, I'm wanting better land basically is what I want. What do you wish? So she said to him, verse 15, Give me a blessing, since you have given me land in the south. Give me also springs of water. And so Caleb uh, gave the upper springs and the lower springs. So, verse 16, the children of the Kenite. Uh, uh, now the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up uh, to the city of Palms with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lies to the south near Arad and uh, they went and they dwelt among those people. Now, before we move on any further, let's remember, because we're going to see a lot of place names here. Um, it's difficult to try to put up all the different maps for all of these names. So if, you, if you're if you able to, probably one of the easiest ways 
get a good map of the um, where the the children of Israel settled by tribe, and you're going to get an idea of the the areas that are mentioned very quickly, very briefly, and it kind of runs from south up to the north and over to the coast and. The cities are what help us to understand, but when they mention the tribes by name, that tells you how to get into a geographical area, and some of the cities you're still able to find. So take a look at a variety of maps that are easy to find online. They would just be too plentiful, too many of them to try to put up uh, during this uh, recording. So it says in verse uh, 17, And so Judah went with his brother Simeon, they attacked the Canaanites who inhabited Zeph, uh, Zephah, um, Zepheth, rather, and they utterly destroyed it. And so the name of that city was called Harma. And also Judah took Gaza with its territory, Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. This is um, these are, are cities that are still there today. That you you'll even if you look at a map currently, you'll still see these same cities. Uh, these are ones that become very, very recognizable to us during David's time and because of the Philistines. This is the stuff that's all along the Mediterranean coast, um, kind of midway through the nation of Israel. They're above Gaza, but they start at the lowest or at the, the uppermost portion of what we would call the Gaza Strip is where this succession of cities begins to run from south up to the north. So it tells us, uh, also, Judah took Gaza with its territory, uh, Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. And so the Lord uh, was with Judah. They drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. Now, once again, we run into a difficulty here because God says, I deliver them into your hand. Was the, the fact that they were formidable? Was that what kept the children of Israel from really laying hold of what was given to them? That God said, I'll go before you. But there has to be this level of trust and belief that God would make good on his promises. Well, clearly they never really fully entered into all of the promises that God had made to them. Had to be simply get, get it to, to this point. Unbelief really caused a great deal of trouble. They were able to be successful to a point but they were never able to fully be victorious because there was unbelief in them. And, you know, whenever real adversity would happen, it seems like they would just fail. Well, it says that he gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had said, and then he expelled from there the three sons of Anak. Once again, that's told to us in uh, chapter 15 of, of uh, Joshua. That's, that's told to us. Verse 21 says, But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. So that idea that it was never a pure city, as it should have been. Now, we do know that by the time that, uh, that Jesus comes around, the Jews have pretty good control of the city. Um, and it was, I would say, probably purer than it is at this time of this writing. We certainly know what it's like in our day and age. And, you know, it's very much a modern city um, with a lot of ancient uh, ruins to it as well. It's a very interesting place when you take into consideration the old with the new that are right there side by side. It's a fascinating place, but it was never really, in the purest sense, removed of all of the inhabitants that caused the corruption. And this is going to be a problem going forward for the rest of their history, really. So it says in verse 22, Now the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. By calling them the house of Joseph, it's a way of saying the other half of Manasseh joined with Ephraim. Those were the two sons of Joseph, and they represent those two tribes. They came against Bethel, and they took it. The house of Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel. The name of that city was formerly Luz. And when the spies saw a man coming out of that city, they said to him, Please show us the entrance to that city that we may show you mercy. This sound, sounds very similar to what had taken place at Jericho, the first of their conquests of Rahab. Once again, we will let you live if you, if you uh, help us in this. Well, 
Verse 25, so he showed them the entrance of the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they, uh, but they let the man and all of his family go. The man went to uh, the land of the Hittites, built a city, and he called its name Luz, uh, which, is, uh, which is its name to this day. So once again, here's one of those questions. Was that what God had asked them to do, or was it that they looked for the easy way of doing it? Are they remembering the things of Jericho? There are a lot of questions that could be asked of this. It doesn't tell us that, that God had said, do this. Nowhere in here do you get that impression. They just deal with it in ways that seem workable. They see a guy coming out, tell us how to get into the town and we'll let you live. Well, was it a good thing that he should live? Was it a good thing that he should go to the Hittites and build an entire town? Because he wasn't going to be building it for, the, for the, the children of Israel. He's building it for himself. Well, we can see the problems that would come from that. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Bet Shean and its villages, or, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblium and its uh, villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. For the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. Now, if you know much about this land, and if you're looking at it from, let's just say that the Mediterranean is behind you and you're in Carmel at that mountain, it's there, and you look down into the valley that's there, um, what's going to be to the east is Megiddo. What's going to be all the way down at the end of that valley towards the Jordan River is Bet Shean. So what you're talking about is the, the groups of people that they could not seem to get out of, the ones that wanted to live in the Valley of Armageddon. It's just something kind of funny and poetic about that. But they were determined to, to live there, but God was not determined to have them live there. So the fact that they did exist was, once again, just very clear example, a clear example of their failure. They failed to, to lay hold of what God wanted them to lay hold of. So you see the failure that was there, and it's going to become a generational problem. So it tells us, uh, verse 28, And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites under tribute, but they did not completely drive them out. That is a problem. Again, you're just going to see it happens over and over and over again. In fact, you're going to see that they are held responsible. God holds them responsible in the next chapter. It says this, now listen to all the rest of the failures. Uh, nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. So the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. So this would be, if you're looking at it, if you think here's Jerusalem, and you start to look up to the north from Jerusalem, Benjamin's there, and then you get into Ephraim and half of Manasseh, and then you start to move. We're looking at the tribes that started to settle towards the north and even towards the Mediterranean coast. That's what's mentioned here. Um, verse 30 nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, the inhabitants of Nahol. Nahol. Uh, so the Canaanites dwelt among them, and they put them under tribute. Nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, or the inhabitants of Sidon, or Ahlab, or Akzib, um, Helba, Ephik, or uh, Rehob. They, none of these places were expelling uh, or were expelled of the uh, the inhabitants, the Canaanites. They didn't drive them out. So it tells us also, uh, so the Asherites dwell among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Nor did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Bet Shemesh. Now there are, there's another Bet Shemesh, which is uh, quite a bit further to the south, below Jerusalem. So same uh, same name, a different location. Uh, nor did the um, inhabitants of Bet, Bet Anash, or Beth Anath. Um, but they dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Bet Shemesh and Beth Anath were put under tribute to them. So this is the repeating cycle. There is this agreement that they'll always reach. The people don't want to leave. They don't drive them out. So the agreement is, if we let you stay here, you're going to have to be our servants, our slaves. They agree to that. The Ammonites forced the children of Dan into the mountains. That's kind of a new thing. That This is instead of the, the children of Israel driving them out, now the children of Dan are being driven by the, the others. For they would not allow them to come down into the valley. 
Wow. Now, see, that, that just shows you that Dan never really laid hold of the fact that God had given them the land. If this land was given to them as an inheritance, and now the inhabitants of the land before they got there are able to chase them, you know that God's no longer fighting your battles. What's so weird about this, in all of these, in all of the sense of the, of the tribes, let's make sure we understand this. If the tribes would have come to the Lord and said something along these lines, God, the people that are here are incredibly resistant to us, but you have given us this land. So we're asking that you drive them out. We don't want to make any kind of overtures to them. We don't want them as servants. We don't want them dwelling among us. Would you give us victory? I don't care who the chariots of iron people are. I don't care who the ones that lived in the lowlands of Dan. I don't care who it was. The land was the land. And it was given to the children of Israel as an inheritance. No one should have been able to stand against them. That's what God said to Joshua. When you come into that land, no one will be able to stand against you if you do those things that I'm telling you to do. Be strong, be courageous. Well, by this time you can see that the, the compromise was in full, full retreat. Well... It says, um, so then Naphtali, um, I'm sorry, verse, um, verse 34, we'll just read it one more time. The Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down into the valley. Then the Amorites uh, were determined to dwell at Mount Heres and uh, uh, Agilon, and Sheb, uh, Shelbim, yet uh, when the children, strength of the, when when the, <laughs> all these names get to be difficult, as you can well see, yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, then they were put under tribute. Now, the boundary of the Amorites was from the ascent of Acrabim Akrab, uh, to Selah and upward. So, again, these are, best we can tell, these are cities that we can know the basic general area of it. We can still go and see what um, what the kind of high and low areas are, and you can kind of piece it together a little bit. If it's something that you're interested in, again, there are decent maps that you can find online, so you can, you can take a look at those. Mm -hmm. Chapter 2 opens with a really, really intriguing... Um, bit of uh, of back and forth that God is going to have with the with the children of Israel. Now, when we think of angels, you know, we, we just think of these messengers of God. And yet they're just angels. They're just part of God's creation and God uses them as messengers. This one is completely different. And you'll find him making his appearance from time to time throughout all of Scripture. Um, I think we can just kind of put away any question whether or not this was just a, a pre-Jesus appearance, before we knew him as Jesus or before he became uh, dwelling among us. This is clearly God who is speaking here because he is speaking of things that he personally accomplished, things that God said that he had done. So this messenger or the one that is known as the angel of the Lord it puts him in a different category than other angels. And he speaks as being the one who did all of the work of them coming out of Egypt. So these are what are called theophanies or Christophanies. Um, we know that if there is a, a physical representation, the Father doesn't reveal himself that way. The Son is able to. So to me, there's really not much question here that this is Jesus appearing before we know him as Jesus, before he took on the body of flesh and blood, he would appear as the angel of the Lord. Again, look at how he speaks, and he speaks with an authority that only God can speak. You'll see it when we read through it. So chapter 2, verse 1 starts this. Now, the angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bacham and said, I led you out of, from Egypt, and I brought you to the land which I swore to your fathers, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you. No angel made that covenant. Only God made that covenant. So this angel of the Lord speaks as though he's God. The only person that this could be able to do this is the one that we would know as Jesus because that's how we know him when he became a human being. Here he is the messenger of the Lord, or referred to as an angel of the Lord. So, in verse 2 it says, And you shall make no covenant. Here's what I told you to do. Make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, 
Instead, what you will do is tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice, and so why have you done this? Now notice what's here. There's an accountability that's taking place. This is what you were told to do. You've refused to do it. Why did you refuse to do it? So God, of course, already knows the answer. The only reason that he would ask them this is because there must be accountability for their lack of, of obedience, their lack of faith, and what is now going to be a continuing problem through their history. Interestingly enough, they still at this point do not do the complete turning back as one people. If they had done this, if all of the, the tribes, I believe, if they had all gotten together and say, God, what we have all done collectively, we have been disobedient. We have not followed you. We are repentant. And if they fell upon him for his forgiveness and said, can we just kind of you know, they would never say it like this. This is a 21st century thing. Can we hit the reset button? And if we do, and if we go and we do everything that you're asking us to do, can we go in and subdue the land and drive out every single one of the inhabitants, even the ones that are the most resistant? Will you deliver them into our hands? We are sorry for not taking you at your word. I believe God would have given it to them. I believe he would have done it. But they were not willing to. He knew it, so he pronounces the judgment at this time. Therefore... I also said, verse 3, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall snare shall be a snare to you. So not only does God say, you've not done this, you're not looking to get it fixed, now they're going to be a problem among you, and it's your fault. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the, the name of that place uh, Bachim, and uh, they sacrificed to the Lord there. That just means the, the people who weep, or the weeping, the weepers. That's what this the name of the place meant. So, again, they made a sacrifice, but it doesn't say that they sought that the Lord would, would relent from that, that they could do what was necessary to see that they were victorious. They seemed to be resigned to the fact that they were going to fail. And they didn't seek him for any kind of, of reparation here. So this was going to be a downward slide. Now, verse 4 says, uh, verse 5 rather, sorry, verse 6. And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. So isn't that a sad thing? God's told them you're going to fail. And they go back and they just occupy. Well, so the people serve the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which the Lord had done in Israel. Now, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. They buried him within the border of his inheritance at Tim, uh, Timnath, Harry's, in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gash. Now, notice what's said there. That during the time that Joshua was alive and those people who were the elders that were of his kind of vintage, the children of Israel walked with the Lord during that time. But these were the ones who had seen all the work that God had done. The next generation comes along who has not seen those things. Now, does that mean that since they hadn't seen those things that they were, they were doomed to that? No, it didn't have to be that way. In fact, what should have been the case is that whole generation should have been incredibly careful to teach it to the next generation without any kind of degradation. There shouldn't have been any break in the, in the storyline at all. It should have been perfect and it should have remained. Remember, that's what God told uh, Moses to say to the children all the way back in Deuteronomy. Teach this diligently to your kids. Put it on the doorposts of your house, the frontlets to your eyes, the back of your hand. Let it be a reminder to you at all times during all of the things of your life what God has done. Now, had that been passed from successive generations, of course you're going to have the rebellious person here or there, but if each generation says to the next generation, don't lose a single word of this. Make sure that you follow it in the same way that we did. Then the next generation is going to have to do one of two things. They'll be obedient to it and successful, or they will be rebellious against it and they will fail. 
there could be a problem in the first generation not passing it along with that sense of urgency. And I think all of those things are kind of at play here. And so we see the fallout from it. When all the generation, verse 10, had gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which the Lord had done for Israel. So again, whose fault is that? Did the kids not want to know? Did the parents not want to pass it along? One generation to the next, there was a, a complete breakdown. Interestingly enough, when I look at it in the 21st century, whether it's in the church or whether it's in even the world's culture or our country in particular, if we do not accurately teach our history and the things that have taken place before and not told them what was done is good and it should be continued, instead we tell them that everything that's been done before was evil and it's something brand new needs to take its place, nobody ever asks what's the brand new and where is it coming from? Our world is falling apart in, in ways that I have not seen. I'm amazed at it. Well, so here's what we have. This is just how it turns out. So what, what ends up being the result of that? When one generation fails the, the generation before and the one after it, you know, in both ways, it's failure. What ends up happening? Verse 11, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the foreign gods, the Baals. So it only took a generation. Isn't that an amazing thing? One generation, they knew of the they knew of the things that God had done. They were witnesses to it, and they were obedient to the Lord. In a generation, everything changed and the kids turned into idolaters. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and then they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. They bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. The Lord uh, forsook. Uh, then they forsook the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. And these are just again, the the deities plural that were worshipped by the the pagan, the Amorites, all of the Canaanite groups that were there. They found their way back in. So again, they were saying, "We'll live among you. And we'll be your servants." Yeah, but they didn't tear down their altars and they didn't make them do the right things as far as putting away all of their gods. Instead, they let them exist and they found their way into the, the normal fabric of the, the children of Israel and they rebelled against God. So what happens, verse 14? So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of the plunderers who despoiled them. It took a generation. And now the conquerors were the conquered. Horrible. So, um, they, this happened, uh, delivered them into the hands of the enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. In a generation, amazing, huh? Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity and, and the Lord, as the Lord had said. Now, that's an important part to remember. God had told them this is exactly what's going to happen. So, it's not as though they could sit around and, and ask what happened. All that they had to do was take a look at the things that were written. Remember when Joshua, in chapter 24, when he said, this is exactly what's going to happen. You guys are telling me you're going to keep it together. Maybe you're here, the older ones are, are saying it, but the other, the other ones, the next generation that are hearing my words, they're not going to follow. Well, we see that's exactly what took place. So, wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them uh, for calamity. As the Lord had said, and the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who they uh, who plundered them, and they would not listen to their judges, yet they would not listen. Now we're going to come back to this because I don't want to rush through this. This is, um, this is an important part. Actually, it does kind of set the stage for the rest of the study that we have. Um, let's just go ahead and, and uh, read verses 17. We'll finish out the chapter, but we're going to need to come back and repeat through this a little bit. Verse 17 says, Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with the other gods. They bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of that judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by the groaning and because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And yet it came to pass, and, and so it came to pass, 
uh, when the judge was dead, that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers, but followed other gods to serve them, to bow down to them, and they did not cease from their own doings, from um, uh, nor from their stubborn way. So, a series of, of groups or people that were called judges, and we'll study this a, a bit further the next time, as time would permit better uh, on the next study. These would be people that God would speak through, but there was, there was going to be a multitude of them, a number of them. And these were the ones that God would communicate through, but again, the people became so dependent upon being told what to do, you could tell that they were not following the Lord in a personal way. They were just being done as they were instructed. This gives the great impression that even though maybe the judges were godly people, the people that were listening to them were not, but in spite of that ungodliness, because of the, for the sake of the judge who was hearing God and being responsible, God would give victory. But when that person died, we've already read, there was such calamity. Verse 20 tells us this, So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and they have not heeded my voice, I also will no longer drive out from before them the nations which Joshua left when he died. So it's going to start to go back in reverse almost immediately after the death of that generation. Verse 22. So that through them I may test Israel, whether they keep my ways, uh, the ways of the Lord, walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. So I'm going to give them still instruction. It won't come through a singular person. It'll be through these judges, but we'll see. And actually, God already knows the answer to the whole thing. This is done once again for the sake of accountability. So that when calamity befalls them and they say, well, God has forsaken us. No, he hasn't. You forsook him. He's been giving instruction the whole time. You're just not listening. You've already rebelled. That's why you're stuck in your idolatry. It's referred to as their harlotry. That means that they are going and, and, and going after those who would seduce them in the spiritual sense. It's a spiritual harlotry that's being mentioned here. Therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. So again, the, the people were unwilling to do as God had requested of them in its entirety. It's like giving it being given instructions and doing 90 percent of it okay great that 10 percent is still going to be a corrupting influence and now we see it full bloom here by the time that that generation of joshua and the people like him by the time the last of them had passed away then there was going to be this complete breakdown in the next generation you think about this when it comes to generations remember it was the generation that had been with Moses who had seen the miraculous things, but they're the ones who, who fell into belief. Now, it was the generation who came after them that was going to reap the benefit of coming into the land. Now, those people had seen the failures of their fathers were not going to repeat them, and they were able to come into the land, but they, when they came into the land, they began to see that, that way of compromise. They didn't drive out the people, though... God, they walked with God and God gave them victory. They never laid hold completely of what God had given to them. So what happens to the successive generation? Failure and a complete meltdown. But for these hands full of people who were obedient to the Lord, would speak to the people, but the heart of the people collectively had become completely corrupt. They had forgotten where they'd come from. This is oddly enough, you can see this happen with church movements through the ages. Same kind of thing. God raises up these dynamic leaders. They begin well, and then they fall apart the successive generations. It's just such a weird repeating pattern. The further you get away from that, that first work that God had done, because one generation doesn't succeed the next in the same fervency, and there's reasons for it. Again, it might be the person that's the discipler, or it's the disciplee, but there's a disconnect one generation to the next. You see it here played out in the children of Israel as they first came into the land. We still see it in our day when it comes to church matters. So we'll pick up a chapter three. It's going to really start to explain about the judges. We're going to get the names of them and what they did. And it's going to be a, it's a pretty bloody, um, you know, battle after battle. And the things that happened, these people that should have been conquered when, when the people were really hearing God's voice, 
And now that they're in a place of rebellion, now those same nations are going to rise up against them to take the land back. It's just such a tragic story. So we will study through that. We'll pick up a chapter three next week, next Monday. And uh, until then, I pray that as you go back and look at this, do yourself a favor, go through the maps. Look at where this was so you become familiar with the territories and where all these things took place. They're very real places. You can still go visit many of them today. Um, just very interesting to find out that the history in that land of the children of Israel goes back, you know, 4,000 years. And so when you hear Canaanites, some of the places even mentioned here on our trips to Israel, we get a chance to go see them. And by the way, since I've mentioned that, we have a trip uh, right now as I record this. We are in August of 2020. Uh, we have a trip that is going to be going to uh, Israel in uh, the springtime of next year in April. And if you'd like details on that, please contact us on our email. We'd love to have you come along with us. So until next week, we will pick up at Chapter 3. May God bless you.